All right. Thank you for joining me today. As you know, my name is Ben Rees, DCS Marketing. And today I'm joined by Tom Ogens and Sylvia Rissell. We'll be talking about the digital twin, digital transformation, and the gear module for 3DCS. If we can start just by some brief introductions. Sylvia, would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I'm a uh, engineer at 3DCS. I have been using the 3DCS software since 2010 or 2011, I believe. Uh, and I'm just learning to use the uh, uh, gear modeling uh, setup so we can look at those kinds of uh, parts and systems. Thank you, Sylvia. And Tom, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Oh, sure. I'm Tom Ogens. I'm a, a company is called CAE Integration Corporation, and I'm a consultant with uh, DCS on the gear module. And I've been using DCS off and on during my career since the 1990s. So I'm uh, familiar with the, the product and some of the more sophisticated aspects of it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Sylvia. So let's get right into it. Talking about the digital twin and what 3DCS Variation Analyst software can do with the digital twin. Tom, maybe you can lead us off. What is it that uh, 3DCS does with gears and the digital twin? So when you're using a digital twin as a master, you need to have the dimensional engineering uh, tolerances aspect of the digital twin. You can't just run it at nominal. So what the DCS digital twin gear module does is allows you to take the product with all of its deviations and trace the effect into the gears to see how they affect the gear operation. And the uh, gear module is a contact module. It rotates the gears to contact and then traces the contact. So you can take this contact and do multiple things with it. We do, there's a automatic measurements such as backlash measurements for angle and for uh, axial measurements. There's uh, a flank contact pattern test that comes out and there is a pressure angle which uh, traces how much the uh, system pressurizes in terms of uh, uh, angle of from so the like, uh, if the gears are running past each other is that angle like this uh it's actually it can be like that but it's actually the rotary angle the, de the gears mm. for the to operate at their maximum force, uh, some of their pressure, their vector is is done to push the gears, say, apart. And that pressurizes the whole system. And that's and so the gear effect is not only the, the housing effect on the gears, the gears have an effect on the housing, how much they push the housing apart, which again pushes the gears apart. So it's a complete system. And the DCS allows you to do that complete analysis and get the statistics on the backlash and pressure angle and look at the flank test uh, pattern results. I, I feel like I need to bring up the words Monte Carlo simulation just once. Uh, if we have the whole system with the GD&T and the statistical variation on all the parts, we now have a statistical variation on how you're mounting the gears and statistical variation on the gears and then we can read off what's causing the most problems, maybe address that. So. Thank you, Sylvia. Yeah, and there's, there's, yeah, there's many things you can do with that now. So you can find the maximum and minimum using the Monte Carlo situation, uh, simulation and actually display the, the positions on the screen graphically. So that's something that everyone that runs gears at a high pressure or, or during this wants to see, but of course the housing is in the way. So there's no way to see uh, what's going on and the gears are rotating at an extremely fast speed. So you can't really see the max, what happened at the maximum value that caused the issue. But with DCS, 
You can x-ray it at exactly that point at a maximum, a minimum value, or any point you want. Freeze the design in that position and look at every other measurement that's available in the system. So it's very powerful in that way. It, it is possible to do a simulated measurement on something that you physically can't get anything into the assembly to, to touch. Yeah, I'm sure powertrain likes that as well in the internal components of an engine, right? It's difficult to get in there. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so talking about that, who who should use these kind of tools? Who generally uses, uh, you know, the gear module and how does that fit into the, a 3DCS package? So a company that's doing a product where gears are an integral part of it would be a candidate. And they can take a, advantage of all of these capabilities to refine their product early in the divi design phase. And there's a lot of money and, and uh, savings involved in that in both time and quality. But also, the, the real value can come when you're approaching or in production and something goes wrong. Now, if you have this modeled in, in DCS, there is a desperate search for the cause, the exact cause, which requires a team of highly skilled experts to identify, and then the ability to try out different solutions in the digital twin to make sure that they're going to solve the problem. Because it's a uh, if you want excitement, that is the most exciting thing in manufacturing is when something goes wrong. The problem solved. Tremendous right? amount of excitement. <laughs> yes. Mad dash to try to figure out what the problem is before you lose too much money or have to shut things down or or worse, there's some kind of safety concern. Right. Exactly. Uh, that's the good, the bad excitement versus the good excitement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Earlier you catch it, the 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 more good excitement it is. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> So what are the advantages then of using this in the digital twin using, you know, along with 3D CS software over traditional methods? So for a traditional method of gear design, the gears are not designed with GD and TN. They're designed in a whole totally separate gear system. And so all of the uh, gear power companies that do this in the synthetic analysis and the sophisticated uh, engineering of the gears with the uh, capability to do uh, uh, CAE analysis and uh, do these measurements generally use that system to input the data. And their data coming out is generally for machining or for, for different things in their own gear language and gear operations. But now if you want to integrate that into your whole system, it's better if you convert it to traditional GDNT, accurate CAD designs, and then use a system, a dimensional system, to then diagnose and explain the issues that can now be communicated as standard information throughout the uh, company, throughout the manufacturing system and the design system and the management. All are very important. Yeah, if you have a unique language you're using for it, it makes it difficult for anyone outside of that organization to take advantage of those outputs and of that of that model, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. And then, then you have to integrate it into the noise and vibration, into the CAE unit, into the dimensional engineering and drafting unit, into the manufacturing and inspections. So there's a lot of communication that has to happen rapidly and completely in order to get the design correct. So, so I mean, DCS can be a center that interfaces with everybody. It has its own capability in those areas. So, so what are the consequences if it doesn't, if the design isn't right? Well, they're they're not good. <laughs> they uh, they can range from uh, something that can be over found in testing and corrected in testing, which requires a lot of delay. The testing facilities, the labs, are massive, and they put high pressures on these components. Uh, you know, for vehicles, and they are expensive to operate, and they're hard to schedule. So if you have a failure, it now affects every other part that's going through the lab because it's delaying it, and you have to get everything ready, engineered, remade, put it back in the lab, test it again, and then 
try and work your way through what's wrong. There's a uh, equipment with microphones on it. There's all kinds of uh, analysis with it. There's uh, spreadsheets of what the analysis results. There's histories. There's meetings. There's reports. Uh, it's uh, quite a process if you have something go wrong. Plus, there's a list of all everything that's wrong, and the engineer's name is on the list, and what they're doing about it, and there's what are the top 10 issues? How long has your issue been on the list? It is not a okay. pleasant so, situation. So in a, kind of an attempt to set you up to do a sound bite here. Okay, how long does it take to do a digital 3DCS test using your digital twin? You have so, it all in your computer, you hit go, how long does that take? Well, the... Uh, the answer is what are you testing, how many gears are in it, and what are you trying to find out? So if you take something like a differential, and it's a spherical differential, and it's a four gear system, which is a fairly simple system, it probably takes three to four weeks before you find everything you need to know about that digital system and, and actually correct the errors as they come up. Because they, I haven't seen one that go through with no errors yet. It always has something that's not quite right. It has to be corrected either in the GD&T and the parts themselves and clearances uh, in uh, things that would cause noise or vibration. So part of the issue is if everything is perfect, well, you might be able to get it in a week and a half. Now, how long does it take to fix everything? That's another at least week and a half or maybe a little longer. So uh, actually, then there's the I got a question that follows on that. Um, where in, because obviously, you know, we're talking about this as part of the product life cycle, you know, as in, in development, rollout, manufacturing, delivery to the customer. There are a lot of places where things can go wrong. Where in the life cycle, where in life cycle, you know, PLM, product life cycle management, does this analysis and digital twin give you the most value? So it de depends on the value you're looking for. If you're looking for the value in optimization, creativity and innovation earlier the better because after things get set they're almost set in stone they're very difficult to change so that's your opportunity for that type of uh, innovation if you're in the uh, if you're in the area of prototyping then it's all of the problems you don't have to fix in the prototype shop and and in the test shop so that has a lot of value too and if you're in production then if you have the model and you've gone through design, you've gone through the prototype, you've gone through pre-production, and now something happens, you got a lot of experience with the model, you got a lot of experience with the teams, so your ability to solve things rapidly is invaluable because now your your whole reputation of your company is on the line. So there's a lot of people along, you know, PLM that are gonna be touching these these master models, right? Or at least touching these results. So can you help summarize then what kind of actual outputs you're going to be getting from this digital twin? Sorry, I'm shaking my camera. Uh, what kind of outputs are you going to be getting from this digital twin? And what, what, do you, what do you do with those? You know, like, so we talk about this at, at a very high level um, in the sense that, you know, oh, it's good for problem solving. It saves money. And all of those make sense on a spreadsheet. But at the ground level, can you give me some examples or, or a summary of some of the, the values and, that you're going to be getting from these outputs? So, so one of the best cases is the company has a standard that they're trying to meet with the gears of their product. And they have a checklist of things that have to be done. And this is on the checklist. So one thing you want to do is validate that the conversion from the gear design module and the surfaces they produce and the conversion into GD&T and into the product is correct. That has to be done accurately to even get started. So the validating that is the number one output. And, and actually what you're doing is finding all the errors, locating errors, finding things that don't work, finding what has to be changed. For instance, the, the wrong bearing is used. DCS will pick it up and say, hey, you've got too much angle play. Your gears are tilting too much. 
now you either have to fix the gears so that they accept that, which can be very expensive, or change the bearings or change the machining or whatever it is. That is the real value. What has to be changed and what is working properly? Knowing that knowledge off the bat or throughout the process is the key. All right. So how does a company get started in order to, to get these benefits? I mean, we're talking about a fairly robust analysis process here, right? So if a company is brand new to these kind of tools or has just been using BaseCAD and maybe some FEA, what do they, what do, they do to get started? Well, DCS has a very good program of service where you can have a, a, uh, a job in this, this area outlined and detailed and working with engineers can develop a, an accurate quote of what it's going to take to do a specific task and get the output correct and get in, their engineers exposed to this. So part of it is educating the engineering and management force and get them involved in a, in a job or something they want to do and hiring the DCS to do the service work. And you can do a lot of service work to get everybody up to speed before you buy anything such as a, a software module or the gear module from DCS. And then eventually to get the full benefits, you want to integrate the DCS system into the company and uh, use the service module as you're kind of spear pointing into the advanced work. So start simpler and work to the full complement of uh, big capabilities and start using this as a tool to get into the inside the process. All right. Thank you. That sounds great. 